So, as always, we like to thank the brothers and sisters for attending. Uh, we realize that there's a lot of things you could do with your Tuesday evening. There's a lot of things that you could do as far as just activities. And if it was something Islamic, there are a lot of uh, programs you could tune into. So we do appreciate your attendance and we do appreciate your participation. We also want to give thanks as always to Muslimatic University uh, for hosting the program. And as you all know, this program is currently a monthly program that we basically offer uh, the first Tuesday of every month. But we are open to delivering it more frequently <coughs> if we find a significant level of interest from you, our audience. We're also very interested in hearing from you about not only the frequency of the program, but us, we want to get your feedback as well regarding the topics you would like discussed and addressed on the program. Uh, we did previously mention that we would like to receive via email any and all suggestions and feedback that you have. And Sister Zahida, inshallah ta'ala, is prepared to provide those emails uh, in the back channel for those who are interested in providing their feedback. So please um, talk to us. Let us know uh, how we can improve the program and make it more responsive uh, to your needs. Uh, there's a few rules that I'll reiterate before we get started. Uh, the first one is please limit your comments, your questions, etc., to about two to three minutes. We want everybody to get a who wants to uh, comment, everybody who wants to give their input and to have a say to contribute to the discussion. Uh, we want everybody to have an opportunity to do that. And the way that we do that is by limiting uh, our comments and questions uh, to about two to three minutes, please. Uh, the next rule is to be polite and respectful. Always remember that the speaker and the audience are your brothers and sisters in faith. And there's a certain way that we are supposed to handle our brothers and sisters in faith. We're supposed to handle them with, with care and handle them gently. Uh, last but not least from the rules, if you come here to debate, to create controversy, or engage in a verbal altercation, then I'm sorry, but you are in the, you are in the wrong room. And we ask that you kindly and peacefully exit this one. We're not here to debate. We're not here to fight. We're here to share. We're here for group therapy. We're here to lift each other up and not to uh, beat each other down. So if that's what you've come here for, this is the wrong room and we'd like you um, to leave. Uh, tonight, brothers and sisters, I want to... Um, I want to give a word, I guess, or say a few words. Um, and I'll start by saying this. The nature of faith is that it increases and decreases. And the faithful, throughout their spiritual journey, experience highs and lows, peaks and valleys. And Imam al-Uza'i, who was a great scholar from the early period, he was asked regarding faith. Ayazid, he was asked regarding faith, does it increase? And he replied, Na'am, hatta yakuna kal jibal. He said, yes, it increases until it reaches the size of mountains. Faqila lahu, it was then said to him, Fayanqus, does it decrease as well? And he replied, Naam, hatta la yabqa minhu shay. He said, Yes, until none of it remains. It decreases until none of it remains. Brothers and sisters, this reality of faith is something we can all testify to from experience. We have all experienced periods of time when we felt strong, confident, and committed to our faith. And we've also experienced other periods when we felt weak and our commitment waned. 
There are a number of means and measures we can use to evaluate where we are spiritually, to diagnose problems and pull up from the downward spiral or begin climbing out of a religious rut. Tonight, brothers and sisters, before opening the floor for questions and discussion, I want um, questions and discussion. I want to talk briefly about a series of questions that we should ask ourselves when we find ourselves at an impasse in faith. These questions and the personal reflection they trigger will, inshallah, help us to see ourselves from an external perspective. See where we've strayed and see what we need to do to get back on track. These questions are number one. Why did you become a Muslim? Number two. What was it about Islam that attracted you to it? Number three. What was it about you? Number four. What was it about your circumstances at the time of your conversion? Give me one second, yeah, Juan Wahawat. I'm getting my phone is right here, and nobody texts me or calls me until I'm talking. And then when I'm talking, everybody wants to text and call. So I'm going to put this on silent so we will be we won't be disturbed anymore. Thank you. So those were the four questions. I'll repeat them again. Why did you become a Muslim? What was it about Islam that attracted you to it? What was it about you? What was it about your circumstances at the time of your conversion? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be the guinea pig and I'm going to answer these questions so we can see how this process works. So why did I become a Muslim? I became a Muslim because I always believed that there was a God and a higher purpose for life. Islam provided a clear and reasonable answer to the questions, who is God? What is the purpose of life? And how do you fulfill that purpose? What was it about Islam that attracted me to it? It made sense and provided reasonable answers to my faith-based questions. It also plots a course for achieving the objective of salvation through its teachings and tenets. And it provides comprehensive guidance that allows us to be connected to our Creator in everything we do, even when eating, going to the toilet, and practicing personal hygiene. What was it about me? About me? I was lost, living life, and doing the things that young non-Muslim people do. And you can just imagine those things and most of the things that occurred to your mind, I was into those things. Licentious behavior, living in the moment, no plan. I was groping in darkness and I knew I would never find my way depending upon myself alone. Islam gave me direction. I know that without it, I would still be lost. What was it about your circumstances at the time of your conversion? I was doing and had done so many things that were ruining my life and my reputation. I had had near misses with life altering events. I had also recently returned from a war zone and I knew, I knew people, young people, who had been killed or died tragically. I knew that if I died in that state, living as I was, I had not earned a ticket to heaven or entitled myself to divine mercy. So now brothers and sisters, after you ask yourselves these questions and you answer them honestly, you have to circle back and then you ask yourself four more questions. The first one, is the reason you became Muslim still valid? And I'll be the guinea pig. Yes, it's still valid. Islam still answers those questions convincingly, concisely, 
reasonably. And if the reason you became Muslim is still valid, then the reason you became a Muslim should make you stay a Muslim. Number two, what attracted you to Islam? Are the attractive features of Islam still valid? Whatever attracted you to Islam, is that feature of Islam that you recognize and found it attractive, is it still valid? Is, does Islam still possess, in your mind, still possess that quality? If the answer is yes, then Islam hasn't changed, so why should your commitment to Islam change? Number three, the question was, what was it about you? And whatever it was about you, if you didn't have Islam, would that still be valid? Would I still be lost without Islam? Certainly I would be. If that's the case, if you answer yes, then what sense does it make to follow only some of the teachings of Islam or follow only what you like and find convenient and abandon what you don't. Perhaps the problems we are experiencing in faith are because in some aspects of faith, we are still willfully groping in the darkness or we are not taking all of the medicine or not taking it as prescribed. So a person says, yeah, I became Muslim because I was lost without Islam. Then they become Muslim and they only practice some of Islam or they practice less and less of Islam. Are the, is that going to make them more guided? Is that going to help them find their way? They have to go back and retrace their steps and say, hey, I became Muslim so I wouldn't be like this, so I wouldn't live like this. If I, if I, if I keep shaving off aspects of Islam, abandoning aspects of Islam, I'm going to go back to being lost as I was. And then the last question we said was, what was it about your environment, your conditions, your circumstances that drove you toward Islam? And we answered the question. And so the question that we ask ourselves now as we circle back is, is have you, after embracing Islam, have you changed your environment? Have you changed your close circle of friends? Have you changed the circumstances that you can control? Brothers and sisters, if we're doing the same things the same way, how can we expect different results and outcomes? We can't. We have to use Islam to change what we can change. And then what? And then the outcomes will change. Brothers and sisters, if we turn to Allah completely, underscore the word completely, he will change our lives completely. If we turn a little, we will see minimal change. And if we turn away from Allah, nothing will change or things will only get worse. I want you to remember the hadith in closing. I'm going to close with this. Remember the hadith in which the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah says, إِذَا تَقَرَّبَ الْعَبْدُ إِلَيَّ شِبْرًا if a servant of mine draws closer to me by a hand span, I will draw closer to him by an arm's length. And if he draws closer to me by an arm's length, I will draw closer to him by twice that. وَإِذَا أَتَانِ يَمْشِي أَتَيْتُهُ هَرْوَلَةً And if he comes to me walking, I will come to him running. Brothers and sisters, this religion, we didn't make a mistake by accepting it. And when we experience those valleys, it's not because Islam changed or Islam let us down. In many cases, if we really do the introspection that these questions will bring about, we'll see that we've let ourselves down. Our commitment to Islam has waned. Our commitment to Allah has waned. And so the benefits that we're, we're, we're getting from the medicine that is Islam 
is minimal because our taking of the medicine has been minimized. And with that, brothers and sisters, I will open uh, the floor for your questions, for your comments, uh, for your contributions to the discussion. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ali bin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I want to apologize um, to everybody because I simply forgot to turn the replay on when I scheduled the room. And I am getting a lot of messages about why the replays are not on. And I do see that um, Brother Ansari is not live on Al-Safi on uh, YouTube or Instagram. So um, this one was not recorded um, in its entirety. Inshallah, I do apologize for that. If anybody have any questions, please go ahead and take the mic. And if you're in the audience, please raise your hand and we'll bring you up. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I actually have a question. Tafadal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I actually am born and raised a Muslim. However, recently, a couple years ago, I came across a brother who was formerly incarcerated. Uh, I met him at the masjid, and we, I mean, we clicked up, we connected. This brother, um, born and raised in Texas, he, he is white, but he did nine years. He did two bids on federal charges, and on his second bid, he got linked up with the neo-Nazis when he came out, or in between his, his period. <coughs> He got his entire body tattooed, every inch of his skin from his jaw down. Wow. And on both sides of his head are four inch swastikas that are carved into the side of his head. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. He is Ahlusana wa Jama. Uh, he did his uh, nine years in his late 20s and early 30s. What I have seen is that there's that developmental stage of a person, of a young man, basically broken. And he, alhamdulillah, I mean, he's out now. He's been out for about, I think now, alhamdulillah, three and a half years. Uh, he does not want to go back. And I, I am pretty much his only connection um, in, in a normal, healthy relationship. My question is, what, what, are, what can we do on a one-to-one, just a human basis with our, our brothers and sisters who are formerly incarcerated and is there any practical nasiha for the extreme cases of those who uh, cannot necessarily reacclimate uh, easier than others? I mean, this this individual is it, it, on sight. He is physically ominous to anybody. Anybody with with sight uh, would have would feel some kind of way. But he is a Muslim, and I'm trying to I'm doing the best I can aside from just you know conversation. But is what what can we all do to our for our brothers, uh, to uh, for reintegration and to reacclimate to society? Alhamdulillah, um, Rabbil Alamin, Sallallahu Sallam, Wa Barak, and Muhammad Wa Alaihi Wa Sallam Jamein. So this is a very um, broad uh, question with some very specific uh, nuances. Uh, so when we talk about Uh, helping brothers in general or sisters in general who have been incarcerated, helping them to um, reacclimate to society. Um, Basically, when people come home, they are in need of some some of the basic things that humans need to survive. Um, But great care has to be Um, applied when facilitating or providing for those needs and then they have some specific additional needs because of the propensity for them to return uh, to the behaviors that led to their incarceration in the first place. So when you look at people who have um, gotten out of prison they just like all other human beings they need a place to stay. They need a place to lay their heads, they need shelter, and they need this, the, the security and stability that comes with having a place where you can sleep every night. Um, they also need uh, some type of 
source of income and revenue, some uh, legal source of income, income and revenue so that they can provide for their basic needs. Um, and so these, this is, again, another human need that everybody um, requires. The problem is, is that in their case, because of, for example, a felony, it may be difficult for them to find a place to live. It may be difficult, you know, especially challenging for them to find work, to find employment. And so one of the things that Muslim individuals and Muslim communities uh, can do is that they can help uh, Muslims, formerly incarcerated Muslims, to find employment and to find shelter. And I'm not saying this is an easy thing, but it's one of those uh, needs uh, that must be provided for. It, it has to be at the very top of the list. They have to have a place to stay uh, for an extended period of time, and they have to have uh, some type of income and revenue for which they can provide for themselves, feed themselves, clothe themselves, etc. Uh, they will also need a, a good support system. They'll need a, a circle of companions that can help them stay on the straight path, stay on the straight and narrow. Uh, they will need this more. We all need this. We all need companions. But they need it more uh, than we do because they are, again, um, they are particularly predisposed to certain uh, behaviors. If they backslide into, into their previous behaviors, it could mean what? Another bid. It could mean um, going back to prison uh, and not getting the opportunity for parole, um, etc. And so they are particularly in need of a support system, a number of people who will befriend them, another, a number of people who will give them advice, give them support, uh, befriend them, etc. And will keep them away from and give them no reason to return to the company that they used to keep uh, that actually got them in trouble. Um, the fourth uh, thing that they need is they need faith and they need for their knowledge of the religion to be uh, constantly increased and their faith to be constantly nourished. And this is another critical component I have seen uh, formerly incarcerated brothers and sisters who came out and they didn't have uh, any one or any number of these four things. And they ended up either being able to stay out but not stay Muslim or not stay Muslim or stay out. And so these four things are the most critical things that we as communities and in, as individual Muslims uh, can provide. Uh, with respect to the brother that you mentioned, um, there's no doubt that he has a particularly um, challenging uh, situation. And it's going to require um, additional support. And it's going to um, require, you know, additional like, um, an additionally responsive approach. What I would say uh, is that you, would, you could speak to people that you know, that you feel if they are talked to and if they are familiarized with the situation and given the backstory as you have given, that they will be able to put his appearance aside and they will be able to show him the mercy and the compassion that we as Muslims are supposed to show one another, irrespective of our pasts, irrespective of our appearances. And I would encourage you, once you have identified those people, uh, to talk to them and encourage them to um, join you in being a support group for him. Uh, I would also say um, that there may be other formerly incarcerated uh, brothers who might be the ideal companions for him, provided that they themselves have demonstrated um, that they are committed to Islam and they're committed to avoiding recidivism. They're committed to avoiding uh, criminal activity. They have been decriminalized, right? They have just left that life behind them uh, and they are committing, they, are, they have committed themselves uh, to being upright Muslims and upright members of society. The reason why I say former, formerly incarcerated Muslims is because they can empathize in a way that none of us can who have never been incarcerated. 
And so these might be a few um, solutions. Again, it's a very broad topic and the situation of the brother requires some specifically responsive care. But I hope that this answer will, will provide um, some, it will help in some ways, uh, maybe not entirely, but somewhat. Barakallahu Assalamualaikum, Sister Khadija. Did you have a question? I um, did have a question, but a comment. I just want to, Assalamualaikum. I wanted Assalamualaikum. to um, thank you guys for having this uh, group, uh, this forum, and my sister Walia, who I've never met in person, but you would never believe it. She is always reminding me that when I struggle with something, to make salat. She's always asking, have you made salat? So I'm a revert. I uh, reverted to Islam would be four years this coming Ramadan. And uh, it's quite a long story how I became Muslim. But the questions that you posed to ask ourselves was just right on point for me because um, for me, it's to struggle with hijab, right? And um, it's just, it's just, it doesn't make any sense for me to struggle with hijab, but I do. After, after hearing you, brother, I realized, why am I struggling with hijab, right? And so I push myself every day, um, not to wear hijab, but I push myself to think, why not wear hijab, right? And so I don't know if you have um, classes or have group discussions on that, but I would, uh, the, the, for me, brother, it, the hijab has become so fashionable that I have found myself crying in the mirror thinking, I don't have this right. This doesn't look right. And today I posted on my page, just wear the dang hijab. It doesn't matter how <laughs> you know, everybody else is wearing it, right? And so um, I guess I would, you know, I guess that may be another subject, but I just wanted to throw it out there if you guys have a, a conversation or uh, a chat about that. Well, definitely. I can see the emails in the back channel, Sister Khadija, so that you can pose um, topics that you would like to talk about, and I'll forward them to Brother Ansari and Allah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh, everyone. Oh, well, before that, I just wanted to say, first of all, I wanted to to raise the sister uh, Khadija in prayer. I, I ask uh, Sister Khadija that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it extremely easy for you to embrace this part of our faith, uh, to not just love to wear the hijab, but um, to be an inspiration to other sisters who, say, who share your struggle. I also want to applaud you for your bravery, for being very candid about your struggles. And to be honest with you, that's one of the purposes for this, uh, this group. It's group therapy. We all have struggles. And one of the things that helps us with those struggles is knowing that other people are struggling too, and that we're not alone, and that these people, despite their struggles, they're barreling forward and they're trying and they're making their best effort and if they can do it, I can do it too. And so may Allah reward you, uh, dear sister, for sharing that. And I hope that um, the other people in the room, the other brothers and sisters in the room, found it as inspirational as I did. Thank you, guys. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Wa alaikum Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Neil, how are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear sister, Zahida, everybody else, good to see you all, mashallah. I saw your invitation. Sorry I'm late. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm doing fine. I'm here driving in California. I, uh, for uh, Sister Khadija, mashallah, uh, what can I say? It's uh, marhaba. Marhaba, uh, welcome. You know, Islam is the best decision that you could ever make in your life. And that goes for every river. As for the hijab, mashallah, you know something, uh, everybody, uh, this is for everybody to see. I recommend you all to go to the Three Muslims uh, channel. They posted a uh, reaction video uh, of, a, of, a, of a lady, of a, 
uh, whether she was a Muslim or you know or whatever it is. But the actress basically she uh, she uh, did two uh, basically two experiments. It was an experiment basically. What what happens to a woman when she's not wearing hijab and she is dressed you know normally with jeans and you know exposing her her body and the way she dresses and how people react.